week I'm looking at the foundational facts of our faith, which all Christians share. But in the evenings I'm going to be looking at more controversial subjects, where Christians sincerely differ, and we shall be looking at some of the different views of Christians during this week in the evenings. And it may surprise you that one of the most controversial areas of Christian thinking centers around the word grace. It's a lovely word, but in English it has at least 15 different meanings. But we're going to be looking at the biblical meaning. In English it can mean graceful movement, as in ballet. It can mean graceful style, elegance. It can mean charm. It can mean courtesy or decency, having the grace to apologize for something. It can mean to act willingly, to do something with good grace, or to refuse to do it with bad grace. It can mean to be given a delay in paying money for something. You're given so many days grace to pay it. It's a word that has all these different meanings. And then it's used of giving thanks to God before you have a meal, saying grace. And uh, it's also an ecclesiastical title in my country for bishops and for d uh, dukes and duchesses. It's an aristocratic title. And uh, one vicar who was going to entertain a bishop told his little girl, before you say anything to the bishop when he's here in our house, say, your grace. And she took that quite literally. So when the bishop appeared, she said, for what we are about to receive, may the Lord make us truly thankful. <laughs> None of those meanings is the biblical meaning. And tonight I'm going to talk about the, the little phrase, saved by grace. What does it really mean? It's not a word that is used very often in Scripture, less than 20 times in the New Testament. So it's not too prominent, but it's very prominent in Christian thinking based on the New Testament. It's a biblical word. It's a divine word. It's a word that describes God. And in your New Testament, the Father is a Father of grace. Even the Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of grace. But the member of the Trinity that is called grace most often is our Lord Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's a benediction that is said at the end of Christian worship. But I must begin by telling you that there's no such thing as grace. It doesn't exist. It only exists in people, in persons. It doesn't exist on its own. It's not a thing. So when we sing about grace in the well-known song Amazing Grace, we're not singing about a thing. It doesn't exist outside persons. But then evil doesn't exist outside persons. There's no such thing as evil. There are evil persons, right from the devil down. But evil doesn't exist as a thing. And even good doesn't exist. There are good persons in whom there is goodness. But goodness is not a thing that you can package or pick up by itself. It only exists in persons. And grace is not a thing. And it's not a person either. It's used as a girl's name in my country. And one of the greatest heroines in English history was a girl called Grace Darling. And she came from my part of the world, the northeast of England. And she was 
what Joan of Arc was to the French, Grace Darling was to the English in the Victorian era. And Queen Victoria uh, was very taken with her and honored her. She was the daughter of a lighthouse keeper, Mr. Darling, who looked after one of the most important lighthouses round the coast of Britain on a group of islands off the northeast coast called the Farn Islands. And they were treacherous. There was a white lighthouse on the inner Farn and a red and white lighthouse on the outer Farn. And if ever you go to Northumberland, you must go out on a fishing boat. And the fishing boat will almost invariably have a Christian name. It will be called the Good Tidings or John Wesley because all the fishermen in the Northeast used to be Christians. And they named their boats like that. Well, now one night there was a steamboat coming down from Edinburgh to London and it was wrecked on those dangerous rocks of the Farn Islands. And she saw it from the lighthouse. And she, the father was very reluctant to do anything about it because it was a very stormy night. And she said, we must go and rescue them. And they set off in a rowing boat between all these rocks. And they both pulled at the oars and saved at least some of the people. And she's now buried at a place called Bambra on the coast. But if you went to anybody in the northeast of England and said, have you been saved by Grace? They would immediately think of Grace Darling and the rowing boat in the storm. It's a girl's name. But it's a precious attribute of God. The Father of Grace, the Son of Grace, and the Spirit of Grace. So what does it mean? It's mostly used of Jesus. One third of all the mentions of grace applies it to the grace of our Lord Jesus. And it's mostly used by Paul. Paul was more conscious of the grace of the Lord than any other apostle, possibly because of what his background had been. He had been an enemy of the church. He'd been an anti-Christian missionary. And he would leave his own country and go to other countries and put, get Christians put in prison. And God met him and said, I want you to serve me. He could hardly believe that of God, that he'd been an enemy of the Church of Christ and now was to be one of its greatest missionaries. And therefore Paul could not stop talking about grace. So what does it mean? He said, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And I've worked harder than all the other apostles, but it's by the grace of God. Well, now let's look at the word itself. In the Greek language, the word grace is charis, C-H-A-R-I-S. And that's the word from which we get charismatic and charisma. And the word charity also comes from that root. So we're beginning to get a flavor of it. The first thing we need to say about grace is that it is generosity, generosity. It's giving, it's giving and therefore, of course, receiving. But it's a very generous word. It means to do somebody a favor, to give them a gift which they didn't expect. Her Majesty the Queen in our country has a number of houses which she gives rent free to relatives or friends. And they're called grace and favor houses. And therefore at her generosity, they live free of charge in one of her country houses. That's got the flavor of generosity about it. It's closely related to the word give and the word gift, which is why the gifts of the spirit are called charisma. K 
charismatic gifts. They are gifts from God to people. In his generosity, he loves to give. A God who gives generously and whom we are called to emulate. Godly people are always generous people, always giving themselves to others. And that's like God. It is always applied to gifts that are unearned, gifts that you can't work for, gifts that you didn't deserve, gifts that you didn't merit, gifts that you didn't work for. And therefore, grace is often in the scripture uh, presented in contrast to works. We are saved by grace, not by works. And that's a very important contrast. We are saved by what God does and not by what we do. We don't earn salvation. We don't merit it. And that brings me to the second great flavor in this beautiful word. It is not only generous, it is undeserved generosity. Indeed, it goes further than that. Grace is God's generosity given to those who not only don't earn it and don't work for it, but those who have done things that make them the least qualified to receive. They have actually been against God. And grace has that same flavor about it, that it's for enemies of God. It's for those who rebel against God, not just those who don't deserve it, but those who deserve the very opposite from God. And God gives to them. That's grace. It goes far beyond helping people who are needy. It goes to those who have just the opposite attitude, who are ungrateful, who are just not deserving. And finally, it has the flavor of initiation, the flavor of doing something first. Not the flavor of waiting, but taking the initiative. By grace we have been saved because God took the initiative to give salvation to us. He took the first step. He called before I called on him. He loved us before we loved him. He took the initiative. He was first. He established the relationship from his side before we did. And all that is involved in the word grace. Now, I've said enough about the word itself. I want to move on to the whole phrase, saved by grace. Because it's very important that we understand the word saved if we're fully to understand the word grace. What does saved mean? Well, the answer is, what are we saved from? Grace Darling, the heroine that I told you about, saved some people from drowning by setting out in that little boat with her father, the lighthouse keeper. Then what are we saved from by grace? And I want to begin by pointing out that far too many Christians think that Jesus saves us from hell by grace. And that is a misunderstanding. He didn't come to save us from hell. That's a bonus thrown in, but that was not his primary purpose. He came to save us from our sins, plural. All of them, every little one of them. That's why he came. And that's why I cannot say that I'm saved yet. It worries me when people use the word save exclusively in the past tense. They say, I was saved 20 years ago. Do you mean that there are no more sins in your life ever since? Do you mean that you're perfect? Do you mean that he saved you?
from all your sins, from all your sinful attitudes, from all your sinful thoughts and your sinful feelings and your sinful actions. To say I'm saved is to say I'm perfect and I'm not prepared to do that. Not yet. One day I look forward to saying I'm saved. But that day hasn't come yet for me. I prefer to use those texts that say I'm being saved. I'm on the way of salvation. And my friend Jack Hayford has called his church the church on the way. I think that's a lovely title for a it's not the church that's arrived, the church that has everything, the perfect church. By the way, if ever you find a perfect church, don't join it. <laughs> You'll spoil it. <laughs> but to be the church on the way, and that's the first title given to our religion in the New Testament, the way. And it implies a road, a journey. Something that doesn't happen in a moment, but something that can take a lifetime. The way of salvation. So I'm not going to tell you I'm saved, but I'm going to tell you I'm on the way. I'm being saved. And one day when that process is completed, I'm going to shout loud and clear, I'm saved. And if I go on believing in my Lord Jesus faithfully to the end, I will be. Notice that I said if. We're going to talk about that tomorrow night. I did tell you earlier today, was it, that my wife has great faith and believes things that I tell her, but there's one thing I preach that she can't believe or tries very hard to. And it's when I tell her that one day her husband will be perfect. And that brings her to the very edge of doubt. And her reply was, if I based my faith on experience, I couldn't believe it. But if I base my faith on the Word of God, she says I can. And for her, I do the same. One day I'm going to have a perfect wife. If she goes on trusting and obeying, her saviour. But it's much easier for me to believe I'll have a perfect wife than for her to believe she'll have a perfect husband. But that's what salvation is, to make you perfect. The New Testament is quite clear on that. And that is why the New Testament word save is in three different tenses, past, present and future. We have been saved, we are being saved, and we will be saved. It's a process and not a single action. And saved by grace is not something that happens in a moment. It's something that takes a lifetime. We are being saved. And out of the three tenses of the verb in the New Testament, would you believe it, the most common is the future tense. The salvation that we look forward to. Are you looking forward to being saved? Or did that thought never even occur to you? When Paul talks to believers, he says, we are nearer our salvation than when we first believed. Do you ever hear a preacher quote that? We are nearer our salvation than when we first believed. I find most Christians think that when they first believed they were saved. Haven't you heard that? But that's not the truth. We are nearer our salvation now than when we first believed. And when I look in the mirror in the morning to shave, I say, God hasn't finished with you yet. <laughs> He's still working on it. And he can go on until he's made perfect the work that he's begun in me. That's salvation. And therefore, I'm not going to ask you, but if I said, are you saved? I hope none of you would put your hands up. Or only the perfect ones, anyway. 
only the ones who think they've been saved from all their sins. Because that's what the Lord is concerned about. Because the reason why he wants to save you is to make you fit and ready for that new universe that he's going to create. And if he doesn't make you perfect, you're going to pollute it, you're going to spoil it. If you went to heaven as you are now, would you spoil it? Probably. <laughs> but God hasn't finished with you yet. So when we say the words, I'm saved by grace, we're talking about a process which is not yet complete. But one day by the grace of God will be. So when we ask, what are we saved from? And when are we saved? You come up with very different answers. But the biblical answer is we're saved from all our sins. When? When we're perfect. And there is some ground for hoping that that will be when Jesus comes back. For, says John, we shall see him as he is, and we shall be like him. For we see him as he is, as in a mirror, and we reflect his image. When all other people have gone and you're left looking at Jesus, then we shall be like him. That's salvation. So please don't ever say you were saved 20 years ago at a Billy Graham crusade. Don't ever say we had seven people saved last Sunday. Say, I began to be saved at the Billy Graham crusade 20 years ago. We had seven people who began to be saved. And I've taught that over the many years. And uh, people now say to me, I was saved, sorry, I began to be saved. <laughs> and I say, great, you're now talking New Testament language. And Peter says, the salvation that is to be revealed in the last day, a salvation that is waiting for us. You see, if you only look back when you say saved, you're missing out on it all. I'm looking forward to being saved. And I hope all you are, because that's the New Testament hope. Well, now, who is saved? How are they saved? And this is where the area of controversy comes in. And there are deep, deep divisions among Christians as to how we are saved or who saves us. Very simply, at one end, are those who say God does it and nobody else. He does everything from beginning to end. It's his work of salvation. At the opposite end are those who say it's our work, it's what we do. And in the middle where I am, I say it's a combination. It's a cooperation between God and us. And it will not happen if we don't cooperate. Because a gift needs to be received. And the word charis not only means gift, it means a gift received with gratitude. And so it almost means thanksgiving. And the, the service of communion or the Lord's Supper is meant to be an occasion for thanksgiving when we thank the Lord for what he's done for us. And that's why it's often called the Eucharist, which comes from the same Greek word, charis, and means thank you. Eucharisto is Greek for I thank you. So the same word does for the gift and the receiving with gratitude. And a gift is no use to you unless you receive it and use it. But let me expand on these three great divisions. They're associated with names in history, and those who think God does it all are associated with the name Calvin. Though as I'll show you, 
Calvinism is very different from what Calvin believed. Then there is another name, Augustine, who was also associated with that view, God does it all from beginning to end. And Augustine was reacting against a British Christian called Pelagius, who said, we do it all. We save ourselves. And of course, Peter on the day of Pentecost said to his hearers, save yourselves from this wicked generation or this crooked generation. In between, we've got a man, a Dutchman, called Hermann Soon. But when he was a student at college, he gave himself a Latin name, Arminius. And he's a great hero of mine. But I'll just try and give you three pictures. Imagine the tide is going out past a pier and there are people on the pier and there are people swimming in the water. But the strength of the tide going out is carrying people helplessly out to sea. Now, let's imagine that there are two bodies drifting past the pier that are now dead, they've drowned. And someone on the pier dives in, saves one of them, but not the other, drags the body to shore, and then applies the kiss of life and uh, pumping the chest and manages to get the water out of their lungs and brings them to life. In a word, that's Calvinism. The man would drown, he was dead, he couldn't help himself, couldn't do a thing. Everything was done by the person who dived in and saved him. Are you with me so far? Now imagine that, and notice that one person is left to drown or left dead in the water. But now we have a second picture. Two men are struggling in the water and they're saying, save us, we're drowning, we're drowning. And a man on the pier says, you can save yourself if you only make a bigger effort. Pull for the shore, swim this way, go on, harder, harder, harder. That's Pelagius. And he's putting all the onus on the people in the water in danger and saying, you've got to make an effort to save yourself and you'll be able to. I'm in between. My picture is of men who are still alive but helpless in the water and are being swept out to sea and will drown, but a man on the pier throws them a rope with a life belt on the end and says, grab this and I'll pull you to shore. That's the third picture and that's Arminius. Now, I hope I've explained it as simply as I can. The middle picture involves cooperation. It involves getting hold of the lifeline. But those who are pulled to shore by a lifeline will never say, I saved myself. They'll say, that man who threw the line to me saved me. But he has contributed to his saving by grabbing the lifeline. I believe that is the biblical position, that God has thrown us a lifeline in Jesus and said, grab it, hold it, and I'll pull you to shore. And I believe I've been pulled to the shore by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, because it says, by grace are you saved through faith. Not by faith, but through faith. And that's something you've done. That's something that you've done by grabbing hold of the gospel that was hope for you. Now that's a huge division among Christians today. And it goes right back through history. And the idea that God does it all 
when it's taken to its logical conclusion, means that it's God who decides who gets saved. And that it's God who gives them new birth because he's chosen to save them. And that new birth leads to repentance and faith. But it's all his doing. He gives the repentance, he gives the faith, and we have to do nothing. We are saved by grace alone. And that is held by all reformed Christians, as we call them, because Augustine began that thinking. It was passed on by him to Martin Luther, who was an Augustinian monk, and John Calvin wrote a big volume called The Institutes of the Christian Religion, which is virtually the teaching of Augustine put into systematic theology. And the Protestant Reformation was largely Augustinian, Reformed, and Calvinist. Here comes a little uh, complication which I ought to tell you about. Calvin didn't believe all the Calvinist teaching that we're getting today. In fact, one could almost say that Calvin wasn't a Calvinist. The trouble is that he was followed in Geneva by a man called Theodore Beza. And Beza took Calvin's teaching to its logical end. And his teaching became much more harsh, more black and white than Calvin. And so from Beza, particularly the church in Holland, became very Calvinist, the Dutch Reformed Church is called, and that followed Beza. And the problem was that that D Dutchman, Arminius, whom I've mentioned to you already, was really cutting right across the Dutch Reformed Church. Arminius believed that those who believe will be saved. And that's what I believe. That's, I believe, what the New Testament teaches. Those who repent of their sins and believe will be drawn to the shore by the gospel. I don't believe that God decides who gets saved. If he did decide that, then I have to ask God, why do you not save everybody? If it's all your decision and all your work, why are so many left unsaved? That's an important question. It means that God doesn't love everybody. It means that he doesn't love the world. He only loves those who cho he's chosen. I cannot accept that. And in Paul's letter to Timothy, he says plainly, God wills that all men should be saved. Then why are they not saved if it's all up to God? Do you follow the difficulty? And I just don't have that difficulty because I believe that all men are loved by God and all men could be saved by God if they repented and believed. If they grabbed the life belt, God would pull them to his shore. But they don't. And the majority of people don't take the chance they've got. You preach the gospel and maybe only a few respond. That's not God's fault. It's our fault. It's their fault. Those who are not saved must never blame God for that. They must blame themselves for not responding. But a true Calvinist believes it's entirely God's fault. And if you say, then why does a God who in his word says he wants everybody to be saved, why doesn't he do it if it's all in his power? And that's when they start talking in funny ways and saying, it's the inscrutable wisdom of God. In other words, there isn't an answer. 
and they haven't an answer. They say God knows why he chooses some and not others, but we don't. And from the human angle, that turns salvation into a lottery for me. What's the point of my preaching the gospel to you if God has already decided which of you are going to get saved and which aren't? If you're just puppets, I'd give up preaching the gospel tomorrow. I only preach it because I want people to respond. I want people to, by faith, respond to grace and receive the gift of salvation that's being held out to them. So I'm giving the whole game away. I'm not a Pelagian, as they're called, thinking that with that British man, Pelagian, he was a monk. And I'm afraid what led him astray was he went to Rome and was so horrified by the low standards of Christian living in Rome, immoral standards, that he felt the whole problem was they weren't making enough effort themselves. And therefore he tended to put the whole responsibility for their condition on them and then preached that the whole responsibility is on unbelievers to become believers. I'm not there. Nor am I with the Calvinists who say that it's all of God and that he makes the decision who gets saved and uh, he does everything. But I am an Arminian. Funnily enough, I was called an Arminian long before I knew anything about Arminius. And I thought, I must study this man if I'm supposed to be his follower. And I got hold of three volumes of his works, thick, big volumes, and started reading it. And I thought, but that's what I preach. That's in the Bible. I'll tell you a little more about Arminius because this name Arminium is so, Arminian is so freely scattered around and people don't even know who he was or what he stood for. It's become a label to criticize other Christians. But he was an amazing man. Um, his father died in the year that he was born. Uh, he became a scholar. He went to one university after another. And he finished up in Geneva, where Calvin had been, but now it was in the hands of Beza. And as he listened to Beza's teaching, he thought, no, I can't go along with that. That's not biblical. And finally, he came back after wandering through other countries. He came back to Amsterdam, where he became the preacher at the biggest church in Amsterdam, I've been to that church. It's just off the main square, if ever you go. And it was where the royal family of Holland attended. And he became the most popular preacher in Holland. But he was preaching this need to respond to the grace of God before it was effective in your life. And uh, the Dutch Reformed Church didn't like that one bit. However, he lived such a holy life that no one dared criticize him while he lived. What a reputation to have. Everybody admitted that the way he lived was a saint. But as soon as he died, they held a big meeting to decide he was a heretic. They didn't dare to, to touch him while he lived, which is a tribute to him. And so, after his death, they held what's called a synod in a town called Dort. And the synod of Dort issued what has now become called Calvinism and has spread right through the Christian world. There is a strong return to Calvinism in America. And a program on my television told me about a church in Washington, D.C., which is now becoming a very strong Calvinist church. I don't know which it is, 
but they showed us the church and said that people are flocking to it. It's good news that it all depends on God and not on us at all. But out of the Synod of Dort came what is called the five points of Calvinism. You see, this thinking about grace, what I call sovereign grace or irresistible grace, the idea that God forces us to be saved and will go on forcing us until we are. That's the basic idea. And they issued the five points of Calvinism, which interestingly enough followed an acrostic word called tulip, T-U-L-I-P, the five points of contemporary Calvinism. Um, tulip, you know, Holland is famous for exporting millions of the flower called tulip. But this is not the most beautiful tulip that came out of Holland by a long way. Let's just run through the letters. T stands for total depravity. And that is the belief that we are so far gone in sin that we're so dead in sin that we can't do a thing to respond to the gospel. Quite incapable. And until God gives us what's called the new birth, until we're born again, we are totally incapable of repenting or believing. And it's useless to tell someone to repent and believe if they're totally incapable of doing so. But that's the first belief. The next, you, unconditional election, which means that God decides who to save totally regardless of anything in the person themselves. That he decides he will save this one and not this one. And that to me goes so much against the picture of God we have in the New Testament. Indeed, Arminius got his doctoral thesis on the nature of God. And this was the big issue. What is God really like? Does he offer us salvation that we can grasp in repentance and faith? Or does he force us to repent and believe? Is it our doing or his to repent? Is it our doing or his to believe? And so unconditional election means that God who knows what that future life may be doesn't base his choice on that or on anything in the person, past, present or future. That he simply picks a name out and says, that person I'm going to save. And he will never tell us why he saved that one and not this one. It's an extraordinary belief, I, th I find. Third letter L, limited atonement if you're taking these down in notes. And what that means is that Christ did not die for everybody. Christ only died for those who are going to be chosen to be saved. And their argument is that God could never punish people twice. So how can he punish Jesus for our sins and then punish us if we don't accept? That's the argument. And therefore, limited atonement. Christ died for the elect, the chosen. He did not die for anyone else. Calvin himself didn't believe that. He believed that Christ died for all. But the Synod of Dort made that a Calvinist point. Jesus died only for some, the ones that God had chosen to be saved. The fourth point was irresistible grace. And that is the belief that grace is not an undeserved favor as I have defined it, but an irresistible force. 
that once grace moves on a person, they can't do anything about it. They will be saved, they will be kept, they will be made perfect because God has decided it. And their cooperation will make no difference. Irresistible grace, as if God is forcing us to be saved, forcing us to be holy, forcing us into heaven. And all that went back to Augustine, who was the first person to teach that God uses force on people. And that led to the church using force in the Crusades and the Inquisition. And that idea that God uses force on people and forces them to come to him, forces them to repent, irresistible grace has damaged the church very, very greatly and led to the church using force to make people Christian. Which, by the way, Augustine based on a parable of Jesus, the parable of the wedding feast where people wouldn't come in and then the owner of the feast said, then go into the country lanes and persuade people or compel people to come in. He didn't mean compel by force, drag them in by the scruff of their neck. He meant persuade them to accept the invitation. But that one text became for Augustine the justification for forcing people to become Christian. And that's what they tried to do in the Inquisition. That's why armies, Christian armies, set off to use force to regain the places of pilgrimage in the Holy Land in the Crusades. Number five, P, is called perseverance of the saints. I think that word is a little misleading. I'd prefer them to call it, what? Preservation of the saints because it's the belief that once you start the Christian life, you can do nothing about it. You will continue and complete it because God will make you. It's the belief that the saints will persevere to the end because God will make them persevere. Again, that's not my Bible. And tomorrow night I'm going to talk about can you lose your salvation? About the popular phrase, once saved, always saved. Have you heard that? You won't find that phrase in the Bible. And I don't believe you'll find the idea in the Bible. The Bible calls us to press on. The Bible calls us to make every effort after that holiness without which no one will see the Lord but more of that tomorrow night. It's part of the package of the Calvinist that God will force you to continue growing towards holiness until you are perfect. Now I know the Bible says he is able to finish what he's begun in you, but it doesn't say he is certain to. It says he is able to. He is able to keep you, it says. doesn't say he's certain to. Those who go on trusting and obeying the Lord, those who go on in faith, he is able to keep them to the end. He's able to bring them to perfection. But it's those who go on believing, go on trusting. Faith is not something you exercise for one minute and get your ticket to heaven and then it's all over. Faith is being faithful, believing when everything goes wrong, hanging on to God, being a clinger when everything looks black. That's faith. That's saving faith. And he that endures to the end shall be saved. That's Jesus' promise. So if we endure, if we go on trusting, if we go on believing, then we will arrive. We'll get there. We're on the way. And if we stay on that way, it leads to heaven. I have no doubt about that. But if we stray off the way, 
we're heading somewhere else. And that's a very important truth. So that's the Calvinist package of the belief in what's called sovereign grace, which is spelled out in the fourth point as irresistible grace. I do not believe that God's grace is irresistible. I believe he's given us the freedom to say no, the freedom to resist him, the freedom to rebel, the freedom, as one writer in the New Testament puts it, to insult the spirit of grace by going back to our old life. And you know as well as I do that America is packed with people who made a decision for Christ, but who are not walking the way now. Backsliders are everywhere. I'm meeting them. And the figures of big evangelistic crusades are a bit misleading. We did a bit of research in England after dear Billy Graham had preached the gospel faithfully and thousands had responded. Only one in 16 was still on the way five years later. And the trouble is all those others will tell you, oh, we tried it and it just didn't work. And they were told they'd been born again. We must really have a burden for this. It isn't automatic that if someone begins the way that they'll finish up at the end of it. All the way through was saved by grace through faith. And it's not done in a moment. The process is dependent on our continuing faith in the Lord Jesus. But more of that tomorrow night. So I've talked to you about saving grace. I've talked to you about sovereign grace. But in the time that remains to me, I want to talk about another kind of teaching about grace, which is now spreading rapidly around the world through the internet. And my, what a world we live in. To think that my words here have been watched all over the world. It's frightening. <laughs> Especially when Jesus said, for every careless word, we'll be brought into judgment. And my preaching is full of careless words. <laughs> and uh, yet it's spreading all, all over the place. Well, there's a new view of grace which is spreading rapidly around the world. And this time it's called free grace. I wonder if you've come across this one. Sovereign grace is the belief that grace is not an undeserved favor, but an irresistible force. Free grace is almost the opposite. It's being taught here in America. I picked up the other day a book called Without Charge. And it's a book about free grace. And uh, it's also going out from a center, I won't name the person, but from a center in Singapore. It's spreading right through a Asia and Africa. Free grace. Now let me say straight away that grace is free. You don't have to work for it. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to pay for it. It's free. But that doesn't mean you don't have to do anything to receive it. That's where the rub comes. And some Christians have a kind of phobia about the word works. I've already told you that the New Testament frequently says we're saved by grace, not by works. We are saved for works, for good deeds, but we're not saved by them. We're saved by the free grace of God. So what's wrong with the teaching of free grace? Well, it is this phobia about works. And it's taken to mean that we must do nothing towards salvation. Nothing at all. Except one thing, just believe. And this is based on the 
scripture, as I'll show you in a moment, but it's rightly called, I believe, cheap grace. Grace is not cheap. It's very costly. It cost Jesus everything. In fact, some people have neatly called grace G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense, and that's not a bad idea, but it's not the essential meaning of the word grace. We believe that a gift has to be received, or I believe, that it's not just God holding it out, but I need to reach out and take it. I was once in a church where I was trying to make this point important and to make it real, I had a big bar of chocolate in the pulpit. And I said, this bar of chocolate is free for the first person who will come out and get it. And it's amazing, none of them moved. <laughs> I think perhaps they were a bit too embarrassed to run out and get it, but finally a 10-year-old boy ran out up the aisle and I gave him the chocolate and he had it unwrapped and was eating it before he went back to his seat. <laughs> and I said, that bar was free for anybody. But only one person here came out and took it and he's enjoying it. That's how I see grace. That boy didn't earn it. He didn't work for it. It was entirely free but he needed to do something before it was his. Get the message? And to think that we don't need to do anything to receive grace, I believe is not biblically true. A gift needs to be appropriated. And as I've already said, the reason why so many are not saved by grace is not God's choice. It has been our choice. The reason why one little boy got chocolate that morning was that he ran out and grabbed it. And I was so thrilled. I was impressed that it was a boy because I'm sure some of the adults were chocoholics <laughs> and not one of them moved. <laughs> That's why so many are not saved. They're not doing anything. It's not that the doing something deserves it. It's a free gift. But a free gift is no use unless somebody acts. And both repentance and faith are something we do. They are acts. They're not feelings. They're not something that's just inside us. They are something that comes out in action. That's the meaning, <clears throat> for example, of James chapter 2, where he says faith without action is dead. It cannot save. If faith doesn't act, it, nothing happens. Uh, when our three children were quite small, they had a game which they loved to play with me called faith. Daddy, please, can we play faith? And when we played the game, we went to the staircase in the house and they would climb up four or five steps and the three of them would stand in a row. And they said, Daddy, will you catch us if we jump? And I put my hands behind my back and said, I might. <laughs> you don't know if I will. If you jump, you'll find out. They loved this game and it was their version of video nasties. And they would get all sorts of feelings of tension in their little tummies. And then one of them would jump and I'd catch them. That gave a little hope to the second one and they would jump and I'd catch them. And I would catch all three. But the uncertainty was always there. And until they jumped, they didn't know. And that's why we call the game faith. This is how we tried to teach them what faith means. We don't play that game now. 
<laughs> for the sake of my health. Because <laughs> they've grown up now. So we've stopped playing that game, but at least they knew what faith was. That faith acts. It's like seizing that life belt. Faith holds it. And faith doesn't save. It's the grace that saves through faith. And that's just the balance of Scripture. Yes, we do something to be saved, but that doesn't earn it and that doesn't make it happen. But it's the way we respond to grace and make it our own. The gift of grace. So free grace says you don't need to do anything. If you do anything, they call it works and that damns it in their eyes. But works doesn't mean that you don't have to do anything. It's referring to earning salvation by good deeds. That's what works means in the scriptures. But James in that memorable second chapter, which by the way Martin Luther couldn't cope with, and he called the epistle of James a right strawy epistle, meaning not a very valuable letter. And if he'd had his way, he would have cut it out of the New Testament because it says faith without actions is dead. And the two illustrations that James give you are very telling. One is of a bad woman and the other is of a good man. One is of a prostitute called Rahab who actually acted on her faith and hid the Israeli spies in Jericho when they were exploring the city before they came to attack it. And she acted in faith and she hung the scarlet thread out of her window when the Israelis invaded so they didn't attack her house. She acted in faith and she became an ancestress of our Lord Jesus Christ through her faith. Isn't that lovely? A prostitute was Jesus' ancestor and is mentioned in his family tree in Matthew. But it was her faith that saved her when the Israeli army came. But the other was a good man. It was Abraham. And he acted in faith when God said, I want you to sacrifice your son. And that was his only son. And by the way, it wasn't a boy. By that time, his son was a man. Years ago, I went to Israel and I always make for the artists of Israel. They seem to have more vision than anybody. So I go the rounds of the artists' shops and studios, and I love looking at Israeli art. And I went into a little shop, and here was a terribly crippled man with his body crippled, and all his limbs were held together with straps, and. There he was at his bench with a huge magnifying glass in front of him and he was working little models with silver and the people in the model were about an inch high and their faces had expressions on them. They were marvelous little things. And when I looked at the models on his shelves, I said, you are making little sculptures of every part of the Old Testament. And he said, that's right. So I looked around and I picked out my favorite and it showed little, little Abraham with his hand raised and a knife in the hand, ready to plunge into Isaac's breast on Mount Maria. And the silver models were placed on a lump of rock and I said, is that rock from Mount Maria? And he said, of course. And he would go and find a rock for every Old Testament scene, bring it back to his studio and put the little silver figures attached to the rock. And there was a palm tree on this little piece of rock and above the palm tree was an angel with wings, with arms outstretched 
with an open mouth saying, stop! Just when Abraham was about to kill his son. I've still got that at home. Uh, he let me buy it, but he told me it will never be yours. It will always be my sculpture. <laughs> and there it is on my desk at home, and I often look at it and see Abraham about to kill Isaac. And James says, that was faith acting. His only son, and God had promised him that son, and it was his only hope for the future, and now God said, offer him to me. But here's the point I want to make. This little man, I asked him how he got so crippled, and he said he was blown up by a mine during one of the Israeli wars. And then he asked me questions. He said, why do you come to Israel? I said, because I love the Bible. And the Bible is all about Israel. Oh, he said, how well do you know your Bible? Well, I said, I've been studying for a few years, but why do you ask? He said, let me test your Bible knowledge. And I thought, what's coming? He said, how old was Isaac when Abraham nearly killed him? And I said, well, I've always thought of him as a, a boy of 12. Don't know why, but, well, he said, you're wrong. He was in his early 30s. Did you know that? It's in the Bible. I didn't know that. <laughs> you read it. But don't end reading at the end of the chapter. Read on into the next chapter. That'll give you the clue. We often finish at the end of a chapter. By the way, the Bible was never intended to have chapters and verses in it. God never told anyone to do that. It's made it too convenient. But we tend not to notice the whole context. We take a text out of context and make it a pretext. I'm getting right off the point now, so let's get back. <laughs> so Abraham showed his faith by offering Isaac. And God said, I don't want Isaac. I will provide a sacrifice for, for you. And he looked up and there was a sheep with its horns caught in thorns, its head was caught in thorns. And he sacrificed the sheep instead of his son. What a picture, because it was on that same Mount Moriah that Jesus died, with his head caught in the thorns, the Lamb of God. Very meaningful. And that whole story came alive for me again. What a foretaste, what a forecast of Jesus himself. But the point of James is, both Rahab the prostitute and Abraham the father of all believers, their faith acted. That's very important. You see, there's a total difference between believing that something and believing in something or someone. I was in Germany in a large city in a very modern church building, and I was preaching on faith, and I said, how many of you believe that I exist? Well, let me try you tonight. How many of you believe that I exist? <laughs> Some of you apparently don't. <laughs> well, I can't make you. Perhaps I should have asked, how many of you object to raising your hand in a meeting? <laughs> but then I asked, as I'll ask you now, how many of you believe in me? That's a different question. Could I ask? Not many. <laughs> but a few. But I don't know if you believe in me, those of you who raised your hands. I don't know. Not until you do something to show me you believe in me. Now, in this church in Germany, I said those two same questions. And a lady in the front row, well-dressed lady, put her hand up 
to say that she believed in me. And I said, well now, dear lady, I don't know if you really believe in me. You would have to do something to show me you did. Now, if you gave me all your money to look after, I know you would believe in me. And the whole place froze. <laughs> and there was a dead silence. And afterwards, I said to the pastor, who was that lady? He said, she's the richest woman in the city. <laughs> Her husband owned all the property in the middle of the city and he died and left it all to her. And I said to her, let me look after your money <laughs> and I know you believe in me. But until you do something to show that you believe in Jesus, how does he know you do? Faith without action is dead, said James. It's when you do something that shows you trust Jesus that that's faith, saving faith. And the same is true of repentance. Repentance isn't saying sorry. It's doing something to show you sorry. And that's why John the Baptist said, when people came to be baptized, he said, show forth fruits of repentance. Show me. And they said, well, what kind of thing do you mean? He said, if you've got too many clothes, go and give some away to someone who hasn't got clothes. If you're bullying someone, stop bullying them. And he listed some very practical things that would show they were repenting. When Paul came preaching, he came preaching repentance. And this is what he said. He said, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Could any of you give me the rest of that quote, I wonder? He said, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, so I did what? He said, so I preached repentance to the Gentiles that they should turn to God and prove their repentance by their deeds. Long time ago, a young man, a biker, came to me on his bike. I heard him coming for the last mile. And there he was on the doorstep, dressed in black leather, covered with brass studs. Do you know the kind of thing? And I said, hello, Paul, what do you want? I want to talk. I said, all right, come on in. And he sat down on our, one of our easy chairs, which still bears the marks of the <laughs> brass studs. And I said, what do you want to talk about, Paul? He said, I want to be baptized. And I said, uh, do you know how we baptize people here? Yeah, you duck them in the water said, I've seen you. So I said, so you want to be docked in the water? He said, yeah. I said, well, Paul, do you know the meaning of the word repent? He said, never heard the word. I said, well, listen, I want you to go home and ask Jesus one question. Just say to Jesus, is there anything in my life that you don't like? cut it out and come back. And off he went on his motorbike. Three weeks went by and then I heard brum, brum, and I knew it was Paul coming back and there he was on the front door step. And I said, hello, Paul, what do you want now? He said, there. I said, what, what do you mean, there? Stop biting my nails. And I said, all right, Paul, I'm going to baptize you now. <laughs> because he was demonstrating deeds of repentance. And that's more than many of you were asked to produce when you were baptized. But it showed me that Paul meant business with Jesus. And when Jesus told him he didn't like it, he was cutting it out. Hallelujah for that. These are deeds of repentance, deeds of faith, which don't earn salvation, but they're a necessary part 
of receiving salvation. Do you follow me? Now the preachers of three free grace are saying, the only thing you need do is believe, and that's something you do inside you. It's nothing to do with any actions. And there's no need for repentance to be saved. And this teaching is now spreading around the world from Singapore and from here in America. No repentance. You can be saved without repentance. You can be even be saved without any deeds of faith. You only need to believe inside and that's it. Furthermore, they go on to teach that not only are your past sins forgiven, but all your future ones are also forgiven at the same time. In other words, there's nothing you need to do to be saved. I think that's very dangerous teaching. Very dangerous. You don't need to repent to be saved. You only need to believe. Now, on what are they basing all this? They have divided all the teaching of the New Testament up into two boxes, if you like, two categories. One of which is called salvation and one of which is called discipleship. And everything the New Testament exhorts us to do is put in the box called discipleship. And salvation has nothing for you to do at all. Only believe inside. And that's all you need. But everything else in the New Testament, and the word do is one of the most common words in the New Testament. All, all that's to do with discipleship. Nothing to do with your salvation. And it's splitting up salvation and discipleship as if following Jesus has nothing to do with your salvation. Do you follow me? And so they've been able to take all the pleadings of the New Testament to do things uh, with grace and put it all in that box of discipleship. And the two bases they find in Scripture for this deep division are first in Acts chapter 16 where Jesus talked to the Philippian jailer and he said, what must I do to be saved? And Paul said, believe on the Lord Jesus and be saved. Full stop. And they have built the whole theology of salvation on that verse and say that's all you've got to do. They seem to have forgotten that Paul then went on to tell him to be baptized. Oh, but that's something you have to do. So that's not to do with salvation. In other words, once you say the word works means anything you do, that's out of the box called salvation. So repentance comes out of the box. So faith with action comes out of the box. And all you need do for salvation and to get to heaven is to believe inside. No need for repentance. That's to do with discipleship. And it's a separation of two things that in my New Testament belong together. Salvation and discipleship are almost interchangeable in the New Testament. The other great ground they have for their teaching that repentance is not needed is a misinterpretation of John's Gospel. John's Gospel never mentions repentance. Have you noticed that? It mentions faith and believing but it never mentions repentance. And they say, John's Gospel was written for the purpose of evangelism because it says at the end, these things are written so that you may believe and believing have eternal life. And it's perfectly true, that's what it says at the end of John, but that's a misunderstanding. Because everywhere in John's Gospel, the word believe is always in the present continuous tense. 
which doesn't mean just believe once, it means go on believing. And everywhere through John's Gospel, the emphasis is going on believing. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever goes on believing, present continuous tense, whoever is believing, that's like saying whoever is breathing, means to go on doing something. And all the way through John's Gospel, and so at the end of John's Gospel, it says the world couldn't contain the books that would be written about everything Jesus said and did, but these are written so that you may go on believing that Jesus is the Son of God, and, and going on believing, you may go on having life in his name. It's a great pity that so many Bibles don't bring out that present continuous tense, as it's known. Go back to John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever goes on believing will never perish, but go on having eternal life. Ask anybody who knows Greek, and they will tell you that's what the original text says. In other words, John's Gospel was not written to convert people, but to tell believers to go on believing. And that's its objective. No wonder it doesn't deal with repentance or baptism, because it assumes that the readers have already repented and been baptized, but it's urging them, go on believing. And therefore, the fact that John doesn't mention repentance doesn't mean that it's not necessary at all. He is assuming that he doesn't need to say that. But he's saying, go on believing, because in Ephesus, where John lived when he wrote that, there was a heretic called Serinthus who was teaching bad things about Jesus. And that bad teaching was getting into the church, and John wrote his gospel for believers to make them go on believing in Jesus as Son of God. It's the going on believing that is so important. That's what saves, as we'll see tomorrow night. So this free grace teaching is downgrading repentance and saying it's not necessary. It's deactivating faith, it's debasing baptism, and it's dismissing the Holy Spirit. And it's simply, grace is free, once you believe, that's it. And any sins you commit after that, are cancelled. Can you imagine the result that that's having? Well, I can tell you, this teaching of so-called free grace has really captured the churches in South Africa. And when I asked the pastors what effect that was having on Christian living, they all said the same thing. They said, we're getting a vast increase in divorce and remarriage. Isn't that interesting? Because even if it's wrong to divorce me, that's okay, you've been forgiven in advance. Doesn't matter how you live now. And that's the fruit of that wrong teaching of grace. Well, my time has come to an end for this evening, but let me just summarize what I've been telling you. I believe we are saved by grace. I love that. I love the word grace, it's generous, it's giving, it's undeserved. Yes, it's free because Christ paid for it, but it's not free in the sense that we are not called to repent and believe and be baptized and be filled with the Spirit. There are things we need to do to appropriate this grace. The two wrong ideas I've talked about are sovereign grace or irresistible grace, in which it's regarded as a force. God forcing you to become a Christian. God forcing you to stay a Christian. God forcing you to complete the Christian way. I don't believe that for one moment. 
and the second false view of grace free grace that doesn't need repentance doesn't need baptism doesn't need any of those things only that you believe inside you don't even need to work it out in any action in any deeds of faith just believe and not only are your past sins totally forgiven but all your future ones are as well so you're in you're safe you've got your ticket to heaven amen I believe in saving grace of the Bible kind that is not an irresistible force or an excuse to go on sinning but grace praise God for his grace praise Jesus for his grace praise the Holy Spirit the Spirit of grace and it's all given to us out of the generous heart of a God who loves to give stay with saving grace and use it in the biblical way to spread the good news to everybody else let's pray father I put all that I've said in your hands if I've said anything wrong please will you blot it out from our memory before it does any damage but I've be, if I've been telling the truth may your Holy Spirit confirm the truth in our hearts so that we believe it not from any preacher but because it's your word and to you I want to give all the glory and the praise it belongs to you alone in Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Well, David will be back tomorrow at 10 a.m. you could take all your